It is, after all, a religion whose central idea is that we should feel compassion for our fellow humans. And accompanied by Dr. Peter Porman, I'm going to see a physical bricks and mortar manifestation of medieval Islamic compassion. This is the Nur al Din Hospital, the leading hospital of the Islamic Empire, built here in Damascus and now a museum. <laughs> This was built in the 1150s, 1154, I believe. One of the ideas which are stipulated in, uh, in Islam is the idea to be charitable. And yes, charity, zakah, yes. Exactly, and an obligation to, to give alms uh, and stuff like that. Yeah. And so if you're a ruler or if you have a lot of money, what you could do is obviously... You could be really like be charitable. Charitable and set up like a nice hospital yeah. like this one. And within the hospital, Islam actively encouraged a high degree of religious tolerance, something we take for granted in modern secular society. The hospital was open to all communities, so you would have Christians, you would have Jews, uh, Muslims obviously, maybe mm -hmm. other denominations, both as patients and also as practitioners. Uh, like a Christian studies with a Muslim, a Muslim says my best student was a Jew, and so the medicine which was practiced here transcended religion. I mean, typically, how many physicians would there be? Well, it depends. Well, like for certain hospitals, we hear figures of like 24 or 28 uh, wow. physicians. Uh, yes, uh, the physicians would do the rounds in the mornings, you see, and do their that's, prescriptions that's the and stuff like that. That's the sort of thing like that, that yeah, hasn't so. changed over the ages, <laughs> yeah. As a result of the translation movement, those physicians now became aware of the latest remedies from as far away as India and China. And as the new drugs filtered in from the rest of the world, hospitals started to set up a new kind of facility within their walls, the pharmacy. So this notion mm. of a pharmacy in a hospital, is yeah. that a new innovation? Well, the whole package, certainly, that's, uh, that's new. And what is interesting, if you look for innovation, you know, like on the level of pharmacy, if you look at uh, Baghdad or even Damascus, it's at this crossroad of cultures. So and lots of uh, new things come in, like musk, for instance, mm -hmm. robal, and you have like Indian drugs. There's like an Indian pill, for instance, which is good uh, against headaches and uh, you know, like uh, bad breath, but also you know, gives you sexual appetite and stuff like that. So, you know. <laughs> Cures your headache. <laughs> Gives you um, fresh breath, fresh breath, and, and gives you increased. And so, so it's like toothpaste, Viagra, and aspirin. <laughs> That's right, all Fantastic. in one. Yeah, Fantastic. Yeah. So, well, let's uh, walk in here. Peter wants to show me perhaps the most ghoulish aspect of Islamic medicine: surgery. Here you have like a wonderful illustration. This. It appears that this is the, the first anatomical illustration in history. I mean, like you see, it says adala, which is which means muscle, and so these are like the different muscles which move uh, the eyelids. Uh. So it was understood then that the muscles controlled the oh absolutely the, the, yes, the lens yes, in yeah. the eye. Yeah, and uh, move the eyelid and uh, stuff like that. So the other thing which which we have here, which is really nice, is I think we have some, uh, you know, like ophthalmological instruments. For instance, it's a hook could be used, for instance, in you know, like to kind of pull back uh, your eyelid, uh, that sort of thing. You know, I mean, these instruments were very useful to the doctor. Although these tools might look crude, eye surgery was one of Islamic medicine's great successes. One innovation was to improve an older technique for curing cataracts called couching, which in their hands had a success rate of over 60%. In a living subject, the cornea would be clear and you'd be able to see the pupil clearly with the cataract sitting behind the pupil, the, the white opacity. To see how so couching stands to, the test of time, uh, I'm meeting up with eye surgeon Mr. Vic Sharma. Right, the cataract is the, um, the lens inside the eye which sits behind the pupil. Um, right. As with time, with age, the cataract, the lens gets cloudier and cloudier, and that's what is referred to as a cataract. Okay. Um, I've brought along a replica of a medieval couching knife and a description of the treatment by Al Bukhasis, which is the Latin name for the great 10th century Islamic surgeon Al Zahrawi. Uh, he says you take the couching needle 
in your right hand if it be the left eye and so on and then yep. thrust the needle firmly in at the same time rotating it with your hand until it penetrates the white of the eye and you feel the needle has reached something empty uh, so he's talking about how to dislodge exactly so i mean maybe you can show me we've got well, some I'm eyes here yep yep and, and i'll certainly give it a shot and what they would have done would have attempted to go in just by the white of the eye just at the edge where the cornea is and then what they are attempting to do is to sweep around trying to break all those ligaments right. of that lens and try and get the lens to drop away from the pupil to allow more light to enter in through the pupil and to brighten the subject's vision. But of course you haven't got the capacity to focus. Oh yeah, you haven't got a lens now, yeah. so that was a big problem until right. people started to do, compensating that with specs later on. Right, right. What is your feeling about how advanced and successful well, they were on the, you know, the, the general ballpark. They, they were at the right place. You know, they were yeah. they were trying to remove the cataract away from the visual axis. They understood so the anatomy of the exactly. eye. Exactly, they had some understanding of the anatomy of the eye, and you know that the lens was behind the pupil, and that's what was causing the um, visual loss. And so, removing that, um, you know, and that general principle is still the same. Right. And you know, uh, there are still accounts of it being used in certain parts of the world presently. Looking back at medieval Islamic medicine with modern scientific eyes is frustrating. They take as true many things we know to be nonsense. But on the other hand, their desire to deal with this vast subject logically and systematically is admirable and truly marks a break with the past. One Islamic scholar more than any other embodies the synthesis of religion, faith and reason. His name was Ibn Sina, or Avicenna, as he's known in the West. He was a polymath who clearly thrived in intellectual and courtly circles. In 1025, he completed this, Al-Qanun fil tib or the Canon of Medicine. In it, Ibn Sina collated and expanded on all that had gone before him, medical ideas from Greece to India, and turn them into a single work. So how would you place this book in a historical context? Oh, it's hugely important. I mean, it's, uh, I mean there are a few books which are as important as the canon because uh, what this encyclopedia does, it kind of you know, sweeps away everything else. It becomes a textbook. Uh, it, be it supersedes a lot of other texts. And people even complain that you know, like, uh, it's so good, it's so tightly organized, it's so easily accessible that uh, you know, like people forget to read the, the Greek sources in Arabic translations. This whole first book, this is the first book, contains what we call the kuliyat, the general principles. So it's all about how the human body works, you know, how diseases work in general. The second book uh, contains uh, diseases, so what we call, sometimes call from tip to toe, like from tip to toe, so he starts with the diseases of the head, and then he moves, moves down like the eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth. And he, he normally they end up at the sexual organs, you see. At first sight, the sheer ambition of the three volumes is hugely impressive. Here's an attempt at diagnosis and cure for diseases as diverse as depression, meningitis and smallpox. And there's even detailed chapters on more common problems. So, um, like for instance, here you have like headaches. So different kinds of yeah. headaches. So headaches caused by pleasant fragrant mm -hmm. smells. Or, and then he's also got um, uh, al hadith mil khimar. So um, mm. um, hangovers. Mm. Oh, jima. You can get headache from sex. So. Is that right? Well, I mean, I <laughs> hasn't happened to me yet, but I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. So. And the treatment of headache caused by sex. So if somebody uh, has or is befallen by, suffers from a headache after sex, and he also has a repletion, so he, like he has too many superfluities or something like that, um, so yajibu an yabda abil fast. One has to first resort to venesection or bloodletting. Thuma bil ishal. And then you should use purging in wajaba kulu wahadin min huma. For each, both of them, I mean like bloodletting and purging are necessary. 
a lot of the stuff in here sounds like nonsense, of course, ah. because this is not modern mm. medicine. No, it's not. Um, so how long was, was this taken seriously? Well, the fundamental ideas contained here about how the body works, I mean, they haven't changed until the early 19th century. I mean, there was, they were, there was progress, obviously, on certain levels, but the, you know, like the essence was the same. And then came the big break with the discovery of bacteria and, uh, and viruses and things like that. And from the second half of the 19th century onward, you know, medicine was totally revolutionized. Ibn Sina's canon of medicine is a landmark in the history of the subject. Although much of the medical science it espouses we know now to be terribly misguided, its value lies in accumulating the best knowledge in the world at the time into one accessible, organized text. The canon would give future generations something to rewrite.